Welcome everyone to the NADP 2020 Scientific Symposium poster session. Um, I, uh, I want to uh, have a disclaimer. I didn't, I didn't think of this format myself. I borrowed this from another conference where they've done this successfully apparently, where, they, where we're, we will have five minute presentations by, for, for each poster. Um, and uh, I've asked people to limit their presentations to four slides. Um, and uh, we're not going to be super strict about that, but do intend to have each poster be five minutes. So, you know, this is going to be rapid fire information for, for each poster. At the end of each of our subsessions, we have four subsessions. At the end of each one of those subsessions, we're going to have basically a panel discussion with the poster presenters. And so if you have questions for each poster, please put them in the chat. Uh, in, in the chat function. And uh, Melissa Pachowski, who is the co-chair. Hi, Melissa. Melissa's with the US Environmental Protection Agency. She's uh, my co-chair. Um, I'm gonna handle uh, subsession one. Melissa's mm -hmm. gonna do subsessions two and three. And uh, and then I'll, uh, I'll come back for subsession four, but we're both gonna be here. Um, so I've posted a link for, uh, link two for the poster hallway. If you want to have one-on-one -on -one discussions with uh, the poster presenters, you'll have to put in the chat that you'd like to talk to them and, and we're in link two, hope that they get the message. And then there's the, the link is right there and you can, uh, you'll be logging out of this meeting and going into another Zoom meeting where you'll be able to share your screen and have the different, the same kind of functionality. So if you want to have discussions with presenters, um, please try to arrange that in the chat function and you can use link two for that. And that is monitored by uh, University of Wisconsin. So there's, there's technical support available if, if, um, if, if uh, you're not getting the, uh, the quality of the um, discussion that, that, that you need. Um, so it's 9.15 uh, here in Denver and that means 11.15 on the East Coast and we're getting ready for our first presentation. So uh, our first presentation is um, by uh, Jana Brovska. Yes. And so are you ready to go? Uh, yes, I hope so. You can share your screen. Oh, also mm -hmm. when you're done with your poster, please stop sharing your screen. Yeah. Okay. Now is, is, it, is it okay now? There it is. Yes, okay. Okay, so uh, good morning. Uh, uh, I would like to uh, uh, present some results from biomonitoring of atmospheric deposition of heavy metals in Slovakia. Oops. So uh, the use of uh, bryophytes, or mosses, as pollutant accumulators started uh, uh, in 1980 as a Swedish initiative. And uh, since 1990, uh, every five years uh, is one survey. Uh, in Slovakia, we started 30 years ago uh, because of the problem of forest dying. So in uh, cooperation with ICP Forest, we established a permanent monitoring net 16, 16 kilometers. It's here on a map, Slovakia. Uh, the last survey was in 2015-16 and recently started uh, uh, the survey 2020-21. Uh, so right now we are in a phase of uh, collecting uh, mosses and preparing them for analysis. The whole program is under the ICP vegetation, um, European Survey of Heavy Metal Accumulation in Mosses and is coordinated by the Center for Ecology and Hydrology and Banker UK and Joint Research Center uh, for nuclear research in Dubna, Russia. Um, for uh, analysis, I uh, sampled mosses of, uh, of uh, pleurocarpus species, and in Slovakia, they are represented by Purosium schreberi, Hyaluconium splendens, Hypnum cupressiformi in the Ukrainian species. Uh, mosses are analyzed, the majority of uh, samples from Slovakia are analyzed in nuclear research center in Dubna by um, uh, instrumental neutron activation analysis method. 
and some uh, elements are analyzed in Slovakia in National Forest Center in Zvolen by uh, element analysis and uh, atomic uh, absorption spectrometry. Uh, uh, in Slovakia, uh, there is a assumption that we have a large gradient of atmospheric deposition because uh, there are two uh, regions that are called Black Triangle 2 and Black Triangle 3. Uh, the first one uh, is in borders with Czech Republic and Poland. And in this region, the sources of pollution represents coal, chemical and ferrous and non-ferrous metal working and uh, the usage of petrol, uh, leaded petrol. Uh, here is also a problem with particulate and uh, fly ash because a usage of uh, coal and wood for heating in uh, private houses. The other region, Black Triangle 3, is in borders with Ukraine and Poland. And in this region, the sources of pollution are metal, chemical, and military production. Uh, from the transboundary uh, pollution uh, is seen the West East concentration gradient. Uh, from the results, uh, the spatial trend in Slovakia since 1990 is metal specific with the, generally with the decline of uh, copper, chromium, iron, nickel, lead, sulfur, and zinc, and uh, with the increase, increase of uh, cadmium and manganum. Uh, comparing uh, Slovakian data from the last survey, 2015-16, um, for many elements we have increased uh, concentrations uh, when comparing with Norwegian limit values. But we have decreased uh, since uh, survey at, uh, in 2000 in the, uh, the concentration of nitrogen. But uh, there are still uh, some areas with maximum uh, level of concentrations. And these are in um, areas with chemical, metallurgy, and uh, automobile and glass production, also sugar mill, nuclear power plant, and agricultural production. Um, to conclude, uh, most biomonitoring techniques is uh, used as a contemporary me complementary method. Um, the more detailed, uh, more detailed uh, analyses are published in the last most survey. Uh, published by the ICP vegetation. And from uh, this survey is clear that there are still country specific trends, but in Slovakia, uh, there is a decrease in concentrations in, uh, of, uh, uh, as I mentioned, the copper, uh, chromium, uh, iron, nickel, lead and sulfur, uh, zinc, and uh, also nitrogen but uh, we have increased concentration of cadmium and manganum that is still, still present. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Jana, this, that was great. Um, I, I'm really uh, excited about people who use INAA. Um, it's a pretty neat technique, expensive. Um, okay, so next up we have, uh, I'm sorry if I if I mispronounce Rajikumar Solanki. Yes, I am here. Hello. Hello, you can go ahead and share your Hello. screen. Is it, is it visible? Yes, it is. Okay, thank you very much, sir, giving me the opportunity. So I have prepared very small slide, and this is only one slide because I, I don't have an idea to prepare. Uh, so that's why I'm preparing just one poster. So uh, I want to try to complete my poster in only one slide. So they, my title uh, is comparison of aerosol optical depth from the satellite based observation over the Surat region from the uh, very uh, Indian coastal region, and. Uh, my uh, study is focused to measure the aerosol optical depth over that particular region because this is the coastal region and also the higher industry and uh, 
uh, one of the textile industry major textile industry here so that's why i am trying to show my result uh, on the base of the aerosol optical drive so every um, as we can know that the aerosol is a very small particle so here i am trying to measure the aerosol optical depth uh, uh, so uh, data i will taken from the modis aqua and terra satellite uh, from from that i have um, uh, noted the result that the modis aqua and terra satellite gives the very similar uh concentration of the aerosol optical depths so in this we you can see the uh, i have taken data 2015 to 2019 for both the satellite modis aqua and modis terra satellite so uh, from this uh, we have seen that the uh, aerosol optical depth is quite similar for the every year 2015 16 17 18 and 19 uh, in the month of may it is a decrease and then after increase and after that uh, there is no data so then we also see the sometimes increase and decrease and then uh, increase and decrease trend for the uh, five year period 15 16 17 18 and 19 uh, for the terra satellite is also shown that the modis uh, concentration of the aerosol optical depth is in uh, lower in the month of may and then after increase and then again because of the monsoon the uh, modis satellite is not working uh, algorithm not working so that's why there is no data and then after also increase and decrease trend for the uh, all the year 15 16 17 and 80 sometimes increase and sometimes decrease so all over we from the result we conclude that the modis aerosol optical depth is uh, similar for both the satellite even also uh, we <coughs> taken uh, uh, seasonal variation so modis aqua and terra satellite given the same result uh, uh, for both the satellites so we can see that the in 2016 the values of aod is lower and then again increase and then uh, again decrease so sometimes give give the um, same result for both the satellite so from the result we can say that the aerosol optical depth for the modis aqua and modis terra satellite quite similar for this region and because of the industrial hub and uh, textile industries and the coastal city so that's why we see the variation of aerosol optical depth like this so this is the my uh, presentation so thank you very much Sorry, thank you very much. Um, it would be great to see those graphs uh, in the uh, in link two uh, in the in the discussion later. Okay, so next up we have um, Jennifer Ellis. So, hello. Hello, Jennifer. So good morning, my name is Jennifer Ellis and I'll be speaking to you about particulate matter deposition to urban rock pigeon feathers. And you may be wondering uh, what in the world pigeons and particulate matter have to do with one another. So first let's consider what particulate matter is. It's a complex mixture of extremely small particles and liquid droplets suspended in the air. It's very diverse and can be composed of any number of chemical compounds. Uh, differentiated by its size fracture, particles less than 10 micrometers in diameter are regulated because they can be inhaled and cause multiple adverse health effects. Uh, for my research, I'll be looking at three size fractions, fine, coarse, and large particles. Uh, fine particles are usually dominant in anthropogenic sources such as vehicle exhaust, power generation, and industrial processes whereas the coarse and large particles are usually dominant in natural sources such as dust and pollen. Uh, now, particulate matter can be removed from the atmosphere and deposit to surfaces in two ways. Uh, wet deposition occurs when particles dissolve in rain, snow, sleet, or hail and return to the surface in precipitation. And dry deposition occurs when gases and particles settle directly to surfaces and accumulate over time. Now, there have been many studies that have looked at particulate matter deposition to vegetation surfaces and urban environments, but what about deposition on animals and in particular to bird feathers? 
So feathers have been used extensively in biomonitoring studies to track the internal storage of contaminants or bioaccumulation of things like mercury, which deposit during the feather as it grows. Um, but many of these studies, if they do account for external accumulation, only do so to correct for its presence and in order to get more accurate measurements of internal accumulation. But birds, because they molt their feathers over known periods of time or replace the worn damaged feathers, um, feathers represent a snapshot of what that bird has been exposed to within its environment. So as such, bird feathers can be used um, or can provide an opportunity to track temporal and spatial changes in particulate matter deposition. So for example, two previous studies looked at external accumulation of fine particulate matter components to bird feathers. Dubay and Foldner in 2017 looked at 1300 museum specimens collected from the US manufacturing belt. Uh, changes in feather brightness due to black carbon deposits to feather surfaces can be seen in the photo to the left. Um, there is a dramatic color change between the two birds, the darker one collected in 1904 during the Industrial Revolution, and the bottom one in 1966. And both of these birds are horned larks. So this study used the bird feathers to track changes in air quality over time. Uh, Petrie et al. in 2019 uh, looked at the deposition of elemental carbon to molted chicken feathers placed in two urban microhabitats one and a half kilometer apart. And as you can see in the diagram on the right, median accumulation of elemental carbon uh, was eight times higher at the highway site. So this study was able to show that feathers can be used to show changes in the environment over small spatial scales. So for my research, I would like to ask one, how does pigeon habitat vary across the urban environment? And two, how does external particulate matter deposition to pigeon feathers vary with degrees of urbanization within their habitat? And so now we're back to why the rock pigeon. So rock pigeons are a synanthropic species, meaning they live along slide and are closely associated with human activities and benefit from them. Um, they share the human environment and therefore they're exposed to the same air pollution, the same particulate matter. They're a year round resident and they have small home ranges and their feathers are large enough to accumulate measurable amounts of particulate matter. So in the field, my methods uh, included pre-baiting an area for about two weeks with wild bird seed. And then after that period, uh, setting out open traps or open cages also with wild bird seed. And when the birds started arriving in numbers, I would set the traps. At two locations, I caught 10 birds each. And from each of these birds, I sampled uh, one primary from each wing and two tail feathers. I'm looking for older feathers based on molt pattern. So if you see in this bottom left photo here, these outer five primaries are faded in color and thinner and frayed at the edges indicating they're older. Whereas these inner, inner primaries here are darker in color with crisp edges. For each population, I sampled two of these newer feathers for comparison. In the lab, I will rinse the feathers with double deionized water and acetone. And I will take this rinse solution and vacuum filter it three times to separate large, coarse, and fine particulates. I'll quantify the particulate matter by the weight difference of the filter papers before and after the filtration process. And finally, I'll photograph and measure the feather surface area. And we expect that the pigeon populations will occupy a range of habitats varying in degree of urbanization and that particulate matter deposition to feathers will reflect these differences, showing a greater proportion of fine particulates to large and coarse particulates as urbanized land cover increases. Thank you very much. Wow, that's pretty cool. <laughs> and so we can't wait to see more results from that study. That, that, that's a pretty neat study, Jennifer. Thank you. I'm especially interested because pigeons are in urban environments and so, and uh, I'm doing urban research, so. Okay, so next one up is um, John Offenberg. Hello. Hello. Let me get to the title slide. There we go. First, I'd like to start off by thanking my co-authors. Um, who all have been deeply involved in the NEDP program for a lot longer than I have. And if the saying goes, it takes a village to raise a child. Um, I think I'm stepping in as the child position and I need to thank these other people for already having been around building the village. Um, I'm gonna talk today about, uh, briefly about 
a contaminant or contaminants of emergent concern, uh, per, specifically perfluoroalkyl substances, commonly uh, referred to as PFAS. Um, there's a lot of focus in the water and drinking water world on PFAS contamination. And much more recently, we in the Air Research Program at uh, EPA's Office of Research and Development have um, sort of awakened to what are the important research questions and needs. Um, and really this boils down to how important are the air pathways for transport, deposition, transfer, et cetera, of these compounds. Um, and what we are doing is starting to address both in terms of modeling, um, which we heard from Emma and Ben Murphy about, um, and measurement of the, um, these compounds. Really, what are, what's out there? Where are they? How are they transporting, depositing, et cetera? Um, and what can we understand about these processes relative to the human and ecological exposure pathways for the importance of air in, in the transport of these compounds? Um, what we are doing is um, taking existing NTN sampling protocols and with um, Martin Schaefer's effort to develop techniques and approaches to do the chemical analyses with minor adjustments to the NTN protocols, we are taking that into the field for um, a test run, so to speak. Um, the goal was to do minimal uh, interruptions or disruptions to the standard NTN operations, um, co collecting excess water um, and sending it back to the laboratory with the addition of a methanol bucket rinse to collect those compounds that are sorbed and or particles that are sorbed to the, the bucket. Um, these are being analyzed by an established um, ISO non-potable water method um, by LCMS MS. And the importance of pointing this out is that there are some compounds that we expect to be atmospherically relevant. For example, fluorotelomer alcohols that are commonly analyzed by GC um, are likely not going to be or will not be analyzed by this, um, this method. There are also additional compounds. Uh, for example, what was found in New Jersey and published earlier this summer, uh, monochloro polyfluoro polyether carboxylates. Um, which are not part of this analysis. Um, we do have additional interest and are beginning to spin up the, the um, internal to ORD process of doing what's called non-targeted analysis, taking advantage of what a time of flight mass spectrometer also, the data it also collects to go uh, looking for additional compounds. Um, what we are doing is collecting at four sites, um, started on or about or on or after September 1st of this year of 2020 um, in Maine, Whiteface Mountain, New York, Washington's Crossing, New Jersey, and in Duke Forest in North Carolina. And that being our background or our, our backyard, I should say, John Walker's in my backyard. We're doing a, a little bit more there, um, additional an additional year of sampling. And um, we are hopefully about to start a year of co-located multiple samplers um, both doing traditional NTN analysis and the PFAS dedicated analysis. And then after the completion of that year, we will switch over to examining through fall, um, hopefully both under hardwood and pine canopies. Um, to put this into perspective for those of you who are graphically oriented, this is a 2018 total precipitation depth map and those four yellow slash orange stars are the locations. Um, note as well that there are other um, sites for which these analysis have been and or are ongoing. These are only the EPA ORD funded efforts. Um, several states are starting to go down in, into this pathway as well. Um, and this is the point at which I do the shout out for next Fridays, 2 to 3.30 p.m. discussion during the joint session um, where Martin and I will be talking a little bit more about ongoing plans and what's going on with regard to uh, contaminants of emergent concern and uh, PFAS specifically. And with that, I end with a uh, agency disclaimer.
Hey, thanks, John. Um, actually, I think that that joint session is Thursday next week, but maybe I'm wrong. Let's see. That's correct. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. And and by the way, everyone who has attended the NEDP meeting, if you attend an NEDP meeting, you're a member of the NEDP, and therefore you're able to come to the technical meeting if if you can stand it. No, we have we have great technical meetings, and uh, everyone's everyone's welcome. So um, great. This is uh, really groundbreaking work. Um, I'm really impressed. We stayed right on time. Uh, with all these presentations. You guys did a great job. Um, I know that, that was very fast, not a lot of time for each poster. So now we're going to uh, take 10 minutes to discuss um, with each of our presenters as a panel. Um, if you would all uh, turn your cameras on if you're able. Uh, I have a computer over here that doesn't have a camera, so I understand if you're unable to, to, to put your image on the screen. But um, uh, we, can, uh, we can ask some questions to our presenters now. And in the chat function, Let's see what I have. Um, so um, I, I'm going to go last if, we, if, if there's time. There, there's a question that I had for, for Yana Brovska. Um, here's one. Oh, actually, Yana, Yana X answered it. So I asked, have you corrected or normalized the moss concentrations with metal content of soils or other substrates that the moss is growing on? And, and Yana says, no, the concentrations were not normalized. The ICP forest did their survey for uh, HMs in soils. We plan to combine our data to get more complex data concentrations. Okay, so that so you are accounting for that. That that's great. Yes, yes, because we cooperate with ICP for Slovakia, uh, also when uh, collecting the mosses, and they do have their own uh, their, their own analysis. So uh, we plan to combine our our data. Okay, great. Um, I have I have other questions for that we can talk off, offline uh, or maybe even in the the, the hallway. Um, Christy Morris uh, said, "Cool study." I think that was for. I can't remember. Let's see. It must have been for um, for Yana's study. Uh, I think I think cool study applies to all the the papers that we 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 just saw. Um, oh, Jennifer Ellis says thank you. So. Cool study, Jennifer. Um, Shin O'Hara says uh, to, to Ellis, is particulate matter deposited on feathers washed and decreased due to precipitation? Thank you for interesting uh, presentation. Um, so some does wash off and some does accumulate. Um, and in fact, um, in this biomonitoring studies that are looking at internal storage of contaminants, they actually have a hard time getting rid of the uh, external things that have accumulated on the feather. Um, so, you know, we don't know what exact amount. So there's like a mix of, of, you know, some will accumulate for sure, even with precipitation. Okay. Very good. Um, another one, let's see. Let's see. Oh yeah, Jen Jennifer responded. Let's see. Um, that's it from the chat function. So if anyone else has any questions, um, there are 85 participants here. I don't want people to unmute and start talking. It'll sound like we're speaking in tongues. And so I think that if if uh, people will put questions in the chat function, that would be preferable. Um, I I have I have one for for John for PFAS. Um, you know we're we're <clears throat> we're looking at this uh, contaminant um, quite closely now, and there's a lot of interest in it presently. <clears throat> um, it's it's um, it's not the most inexpensive analyte to run. So, I mean, I, get, I wonder if you could uh, talk about what the outlook is for um, for doing PFAS monitoring in a network capacity. I think the answer to that is it is unclear. Um, I agree with you that the costs are much larger than, um, for example, the NTN sampling. Um, largely the back end chemical analysis is roughly an order of magnitude or more, more expensive. Um, part of our difficulty is we don't know the scope of emission sources, that is locations. We know the roughly 
dozen, 18 major chemical manufacturing facilities in the United States. Um, but we do not have a good handle yet on the location of chemical use facilities or smaller shops or mom and pop shops or um, other categories. And those are loosely termed categories. Um, I think we're really at the beginning of exploring this. Um, that said, several states have stepped up with their own concerns. Um, Wisconsin, Minnesota, New Hampshire, uh, New Hampshire is considering it. Um, it. There are several states considering this, um, some going their own ways, some strongly considering this NADP um, coordinated sampling approach um, using the NTN protocols. Um, so I, I don't think we can answer that yet. Um, we are interested, but it, yes, there's a dollar cost. There's also a question around whether these sites are appropriate for questions that may be much more emission source focused than sites that were specifically designed to be regional background sites or um, there's, there's some of that. I, I believe that dips into the city depth question, roughly, um, how, how to juggle those two. Um, yes, it's something we're thinking and discussing. Great. Yeah, thank you. Um, Great. And then, and then just go, go ahead. Sorry, this is Martin. I just, uh, along the cost uh, question, um, you know, that we're, we and others are actively trying to uh, build a more cost-effective way to assess total PFAS or something similar to that. And so there, there may be a, a screening tool that could be developed that would allow um, screening and then maybe targeting those that have uh, you know, high levels or low levels for that matter. Just so, um, you know, technology advances and we'll just see where that goes. Great, thank, thank you, Martin. Um, so uh, I, I guess we should we should have a, a question for for Ranjit. I, one of the things that I was okay. um, excuse Greg, me. Yes. Sorry, there's a question in the chat, Alexander. Oh, there is. Yeah. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> um, oh, Alexandra Ponette uh, has a question. Um, Jen, what was the biggest challenge in your study? This must be this must be good. <laughs> it would be catching pigeons. <laughs> so I went in with the belief that they would be easy. And uh, no, they're really smart <laughs> and they know what's up. And so originally we had planned to get six locations and uh, what I thought was gonna take two weeks per location actually took about five to six. So we just ran out of time, but yeah, lots of uh, interesting pigeon personalities out there. <laughs> well, I, I can't wait to see the results in, in our, in our uh, symposium next year. Thank you. Hello. So Ran Ranjit, I was going to ask, uh, so do you have um, satellite, you must be using satellite imagery for your analyses. And so uh, is there anything uh, else that, that, that you're doing with the, uh, the, the optical depth uh, imagery in, in terms of uh, looking at um, pollution uh, throughout India? No, just uh, I am using satellite data only satellite data for Modi's Equa and Terra. So I, no one can study about that particular region. So I have tried to find out uh, what is the change in AOD regarding the um, uh, meteorological condition as well as the, I choose the coastal city. So, and also that it is the uh, diamond hub and textile industry and also the um, one of the economic city. So that's why I'm trying to study about uh, that particular aerosol optical depth for that particular reason. So I have only the satellite data and I am uh, now continuing my work with the satellite data. Great, thank you. Okay. okay. Uh, so thank you very much, sir, for giving me opportunity. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for being here. We really appreciate it. I know it's very late. In, okay. in, uh, sir, uh, in the sir I have a question. Yeah, here I uh, evening time, so now uh, it is almost nine twenty p.m. here in India. Okay, that's not too bad. Nine. Yeah. Great. So uh, I have a question for Jennifer. So can I ask? Oh sure. Okay. So 
uh, Jennifer shows the in this study that PM10 and PM2.5 is something I as I seen. So can I ask directly to Jennifer? Yes. Sure. Yes. Sure. Yeah. Okay, Jennifer. So you are using the uh, part PM2.5 and PM2.10 uh, data, I think, in your study. So what is the relation with your present study? with coarse particle and fine particle and I something um, um you're asking which size fraction yeah yeah i asking about the size fraction so basically you are using that particular 2.5 and pm10 i think as i have seen on your, your yes presentation um, so i'll be doing uh, large particles uh, which are greater than 10 micrometers in diameter and then the coarse particles will be between two and a half and 10 micrometers. And then the fine particulates will be uh, two and a half micrometers or less. And I'll be doing that, separating those using filter papers. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. J Jennifer, I'm gonna get in touch with you about another collaboration opportunity. So on that, and thank you Ra Ranjit for the, for the question. Um, so that, that brings us to our next uh, sub-session that will be uh, chaired by Melissa Buchalski. Thanks, Greg. Next poster session is on atmospheric nitrogen and mercury assessments. Um, and the first poster presentation is being um, presented by CB. Um, from the University of Maine on varied host specific um, my rizal um, response to long-term nitrogen fertilization in Bear Brook watershed, Maine. And I believe this is pre-recorded. Hello everyone. I am Sibi Kiza, uh, a PhD student from the University of Maine. The topic for my poster is varied host-specific mycorrhizal response to long-term nitrogen fertilization at Bear Brook watershed in Maine. Bearbrook watershed in Maine, or in short, we can say BBWM, is located on Lead Mountain in eastern Maine. BBWM is a multi-decadal paired watershed manipulation experiment. The treated watershed had bi-monthly additions of ammonium sulfate for 27 years. The treatment was ceased in 2016, and the watershed is in its initial phase of recovery. And this gives us a a unique opportunity to study the mycorrhizal response during this recovery phase. So our objectives were to assess ectomycorrhizal and vascular mycorrhizal colonization in dominant tree species such as red spruce, American beech, and sugar maple, and to study the potential for soil chemical properties that influence root colonization. Methods. This study was done in June 2018. The design of the experiment was randomized clustered sampling. Seven trees of each species were selected. From each tree, two samples from O horizon and one sample from B horizon were collected with a 10 by 10 frame. For assessment of wood colonization, the grid line intersect method was used where the stained mycorrhizal roots were counted against total root length to estimate the percentage of root colonization. Soil samples were air dried and analyzed for uh, soil chemical variables such as pH, total carbon, total nitrogen, base cation, available phosphorus, exchangeable aluminum, and total exchangeable acidity. In results, we observed dual mycorrhizal colonization in American beech and sugar maple. Even though the colonization rate was less than 5%, this was contrary to our expectations since these two species are either ectomycorrhizal dominated or arbascular mycorrhizal dominated trees. Uh, in treated watershed, we observed a significant decline in ectomycorrhizal colonization only in red spruce. 
Similarly, we observe significantly lower arbescular um, mycorrhizal colonization in sugar maple, whereas American beet showed no significant uh, difference in colonization between watersheds. So we speculate that since the treatment was terminated in 2016, that is two years uh, before the study was carried out, the mycorrhizal colonization in American beech might have recovered at a faster rate than red spruce and sugar maple. Using our programming, we did a generalized boosted regression model to determine the relative influence of soil variables and tree species composition on root colonization. We found that in reference watersheds, tree species composition and few soil variables had a uh, relatively greater influence on uh, root colonization. However, in treated watershed, exchangeable aluminum had the greatest influence on colonization. Then we did a linear correlation between root colonization of individual tree species and each soil variable and found that there was no significant correlation between colonization and any of the soil variables. So our conclusion is that mycorrhizal colonization response to the treatment differed between tree species as we did not observe any similar trend between all the tree species in relation to root colonization. Um, and there was no significant uh, correlation between root colonization and individual soil variables which uh, says that there is a, a complex interaction of tree species, soil chemical properties, and microbial dynamics that influences wood colonization. Thank you. Okay, thanks. I don't know if she's online. Um, I don't see her, but um, I'm sure if you have questions, you can reach out to her directly. Um, the second poster is Adriana on. Um, isotopic composition of nitrate and ammonium in San Paulo, Brazil, wet deposition. You can share your screen. Hi. Hello. Uh, my name is... So my name is Adriana and my research topic is isotopic composition of nitrate and ammonia in Sao Paulo wet deposition. I'm a master's student under Dr. Felix at Texas A&M University Corpus Christi, as well as working with Dr. Campos from the University of Sao Paulo, Ruperto Preto. So the importance of our study is that with an increase in excess nitrogen emissions, it causes an increase in ammonia and nitrogen oxides as well, uh, which causes negative environmental effects and negative health effects. So negative environmental effects include um, poor air quality as well as formation of particulate matter. And whenever humans breathe in this particulate matter, we have like um, respiratory problems. So our objective is to measure the stable isotopic composition of nitrate and ammonium wet deposition. And our wet deposition we're looking at is uh, rain samples. And we use this to estimate the NOx and ammonia emission sources in Reperto Preto region of Sao Paulo, Brazil. So our study site, Reperto Preto is in the state of Sao Paulo, which is in the southern region of Brazil, and in reference to our university, Texas A&M Corpus Christi. Texas A&M Corpus Christi is in South Texas, and then you have Brazil in South America. In our methodology, we collect rain samples from October 2018 to February 2020, after every rain event that happened in Preto Preto. And then uh, the nitrate and ammonia concentrations were, were measured initially. And then we take the ammonia and oxidize it to nitrate. And then with the bacteria denitrifier um, method, it oxidizes nitrate a little bit more to nitrate. And then with, we send these samples to University of California Davis, which they perform the denitrifier isotope analysis and it gives us a delta 15 nitrogen value. And we do a correct a fractionation correction with a model from the ATAL 2020. And then uh, we plug these numbers into our SAR model to determine our source apportionment, which comes from NOx, um, 
the NOx sources and the nitrate sources, and we determined that these sources come from uh, biogenic emissions, biomass burning, vehicle emissions, as well as agriculture emissions. And we were able to narrow it down to these and eliminate other emission sources, such as marine emissions, because we use high, NOAA's high split model, which um, traces back the air mass trajectories. And we found that there's very little air mass or not even any air mass at all over coming from uh, the marine environment. And we also eliminate the, like the, um, co-burning uh, co emissions because Brazil has a large portion of their energy is from hydroelectric energy. So from that, I have three figures to present. The first figure shown here is nitrate and calculated ammonia values for our rain samples from Brazil from October 2018 through June 2019. The orange shows our calculated Delta-15 nitrogen ammonia samples and Delta-15 nitrogen nitrate samples are shown in blue. And then figure two shows our source apportionment for NOx. The from biogenic biomass and vehicles are presented with our rain samples again from October 2018 to June 2019. And then our last figure shows the same samples with our ammonia sources, with agriculture, biomass, and vehicles. And we do plan on looking at the temporal um, trends within the, the sources, but we are also going to fix our mixing model and kind of do it with the, fix our mixing model with the dry and the wet seasons, because we found that during the wet season, there is pretty much no biomass burning. So it's almost like non-extinct. So this will change our figures and we'll change our mixing model with that. And then, so overall we can conclude that with the SAR model from what we initially have now is that the NOx emissions pretty much uh, half of it comes from biomass burning and with our ammonia emissions, a lot of it comes from agriculture emissions. And our future work is to analyze the rest of the samples from August, 2019 to February, 2020 to find um, and we'll find significant trends from significant events as well, including the Amazon rainforest um, burning that happened in August 2019 to January 2020, which hopefully will pop up in our results. And then as well as look at regional wildfires that happened throughout the year in this area. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Adriana. That's really interesting. Um, I'm sure there'll be some questions for you during the panel. Um, next up, we have Jamie from um, University of Mexico on the influence of meteorological conditions on the wet atmospheric deposition in the metropolitan area of Mexico City. Please feel free to share your screen. Okay, um, good morning. Uh, I'm Daimia Vila Rodriguez. I'm going to introduce you to the topic Influence on Meteorological Condition on the Wet Atmospheric Deposition in the Metropolitan Area of Mexico City. The objective of this study was to evaluate the influence on meteorological condition on the wet atmospheric deposition, and the metropolitan area of Mexico City was chosen for its geographic characters, saying it is uh, surrounded by a mountain system that generate uh, certain meteorological conditions, for example, uh, prevailing wind from north to south and high rainfall to the west of the city. The meteorological information uh, was obtained from Meteorology and Solar Radiation Network operated by the atmospheric monitoring system and the rain samples were collected by the wet atmospheric deposition network in the period uh, 2012 to 2016 and analyzed in the environmental contamination uh, section laboratory. Um, the chemical analysis of the sample consists in the determination of the parameters recommended by the National Atmospheric Deposition Program Protocols, which are, which are um, pH, electrical conductivity, uh, guidance concentration, and ice concentration. The main results were that ice was found that the low pH values 
are to the south of the study area and due to the wind transport of the precursor cases from north to south. And the ammonium and sulfate ion present in the high concentration in microequivalents per liter, and the sulfate and nitrate uh, ions present in the highest weight atmospheric deposition in kilograms per hectare. The analysis of the meteor variables should a predominant of uh, north wind um, a mean temperature of 17 degrees and mean rainfall of uh, 35.8 millimeters. The relationship uh, between the met um, meteorological variables and the ions concentration should that the sulfate uh, presented the great contribution to the acid of the ring, acid of the ring, and uh, also the correlation should that the high temperature and pH and ice concentration uh, are higher and with the higher precipitation, pH and ice concentration are lower. The analysis of the wind direction should that for acid events, uh, the predominant wind direction is north and for no acid event is sur sur east. We want to corroborate the above and we carry out modeling with the high split models. And as you can see, should the center sur for uh, acid event, the predominant wind uh, wind direction is north, is north and for no acid event, the predominant wind direction is sur sur east. Uh, conclusion, uh, the station in the south of the Mexico City presented the low pH values due to prevalent north winds. At high temperature, the pH and ice concentration are highest, with to a great precipitation and relatively humid pH and ice concentration are lower. And the high spring model is was identified that the acid rain precursors were not local, but come from other locations, such as Tula. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very interesting. Good job. Um, next up, we have um, Warren Dungan, um, Water Atmosphere Flux of Ammonia in Subtropical Semi Arid Estuary Systems, uh, Texas AM. So, Melissa, can you hear me? This is, this is Dave Field. Yeah. Um, I'm actually, that's one of my students who has um, moved on. Okay. I'm going to present his work for him. Okay. Are you ready? Have yeah. Question? Okay. Okay. As I said, uh, this was Warren Dunnigan's work. He was a master's student of mine. He's now at the Department of uh, National Natural Resources in Ohio. So he stuck me. But it, I, I think it's some good work, and I think you guys will enjoy it. Uh, most of the work involved quantifying uh, water atmosphere fluxes of ammonia in Texas. And there were a lot of great talks already this week describing why ammonia emissions, um, how they affect our watersheds and our airsheds. Um, and then the reasons for wanting to quantify all the sources and the sinks. And one source and sink that we have been investigating lately that's often overlooked in coastal regions is the air sea flux of ammonia. Um, and Warren, so the air sea flux of ammonia means it can come in or out of the uh, estuaries or the bay. And Warren highlighted this lack of information by looking at the literature over the last 30 years. And you can see there's not a lot of uh, observations of uh, air sea flux of ammonia. And there's really only one US um, estuary data. So Warren's goal was to um, add to this inventory, especially in estuaries. Um, so he took monthly samples for about eight months along about 400 kilometers of coastline in Texas at different estuary systems. Um, and in order to calculate the flux, he needed to measure a number of physical and chemical parameters, which can be pretty difficult um, in the field because there's a lack of power. So a number of these are pretty easy to measure just with battery, battery powered uh, instrumentation, things like air temperature, wind speed, uh, salinity, and pH, all things unique for this flux calculation. Our major um, issue was the actual ambient air ammonia concentration because um, as some of you know who measure ammonia, the real time analyzers can be pretty, um, expensive and they also need power. Also the active samplers can be pretty bulky and they also need power. So 
Uh, we look to uh, an older method from Farmer and Dawson where they collect condensate of highly soluble gases and they can back calculate the actual atmospheric concentration. So this way we can go out to these rural areas, these barrier islands without power and um, get an air sample. We then take all those measurements and we can calculate a air sea flux. So if we look at our results, the annual flux for all the sites um, is positive. So a source of ammonia in the region. Um, across the sites, the flux falls within the literature values we've seen, uh, but there's no significant difference among the sites. Uh, there is a trend in, uh, there is a temporal trend though. So in the fall, we have a positive flux. So coming out of the estuaries, and then in the winter, we have a negative flux going into the water of ammonia. And then in the spring, we have at the different sites you have either going in or out of the actual estuaries. We do have some data from the summer, but not for all the sites. And I can tell you that um, it's all positive. So we think that probably uh, the summertime trend will be a positive flux. So just looking at those flux values probably doesn't really give you a reference for how significant um, this air sea flux of ammonia can be in coastal regions. So one result we have here is Warren had estimated the annual flux as 0.79 kilograms per hectare per year, which is about 18% of recently modeled total end depositions. So hopefully that gives you a reference for the significance. Another way to look at this is that there are 33 megagrams of ammonia emitted from these estuaries a year, which is still dwarfed by agricultural emissions. But if you look at the NEI emission for EGUs and on-road vehicles in the surrounding Texas coastal bend counties, this uh, ammonia flux is actually greater than those. So what we really wanted to get at was highlighting uh, the importance of this water atmosphere flux in coastal regions, especially in coastal urban regions when it comes to aiding nitrogen loading estimates and ammonia emission mitigation efforts. And I'll end there. Thanks, that was very interesting. Um, I'm sure you're upset that you lost him <laughs> prior to the NADP meeting. Um, all right, we're gonna keep moving and then um, Please keep remembering to type your questions in the in the chat box for all of the speakers. There's quite a few speakers this session, so it'll be hard to keep track of um, of the presentations. Um, next up, we have uh, Silen. Um, sorry if I'm not saying that right. On the quantification and transformation of water soluble organic nitrogen in a coastal urban airshed. Okay, I'm here. Okay, great. Hello, my name is Silino Pasible. I'm currently a master's student at Texas A&M Corpus Christi. And today I'm gonna to be presenting to you my research, the quantification and transformation of water soluble organic nitrogen in the coastal urban airshed. So atmospheric nitrogen has been the focus of both scientific and policy concern because of its link to nutrient enrichment, acidification of soil and formation of particulate matter. In this context, inorganic nitrogen's role is well understood, but not organic nitrogen. This is because of inconsistent sampling, limitation of measurement method, and organic nitrogen consists of various compounds. Even though there is caution when measuring organic nitrogen, there is a growing interest with water-soluble organic nitrogen because of an assumption of a link between solubility and bioavailability and water-soluble organic nitrogen is bioavailable, and it has diverse sources that consist of um, direct emission, absorption of gases to pre-existing aerosol particles, and formation of new particles within the atmosphere. Also, organic nitrogen can undergo photochemical transformation, which might influence nitrogen bioavailability. So for my research, I collected PM2.5 and PM10 bi-weekly using the URG air sampler. And my objectives were to characterize and quantify the water-soluble organic nitrogen and water-soluble inorganic nitrogen, as well as investigate the photochemical transformation and photoproducts of water-soluble organic nitrogen. 
To do this, I measured the nitrate using the ion chromatography. For ammonium, I used the OPA method. For the total nitrogen, I used the persulfate oxidation and cadmium reduction. As for the photochemical transformation, I used a solar simulator to radiate my samples for six hours. So my results reveal that there is a monthly and seasonal variation in concentration for both PM2.5 and PM10, and that nitrate was the dominant species. Also, both nitrate and ammonium did show similar seasonal pattern for both particulate matter. As for the water-soluble organic nitrogen, there is also a seasonal variation and its concentration did continually decrease from fall to winter to spring. Overall, both inorganic nitrogen did show significant difference between fall and winter. As for my photo experiment, organic nitrogen did photo transform to inorganic nitrogen and there were varying rates of photo production and degradation. For instance, um, fall, uh, ammonium in the fall showed degradation from one hour to five hours, even though there might be a slight production on the third hour, it's more noticeable at the sixth hour. As for nitrate, there is also varying rates of photo production and degradation. So what does it mean? Well, phototransformation can influence the chemical composition as well as the bioavailability of water-soluble organic nitrogen. And this bio, bioavailable nitrogen could potentially contribute to the coastal water. So here in this table, I'm showing an estimated deposition of both inorganic nitrogen and organic nitrogen. As you can see, there is more organic nitrogen compared to the inorganics. So what's next? Well, my next step is to finish up my year long data set, as well as examine the water soluble organic nitrogen photochemical transformation by looking at the mo their molecular characteristics by using the orbit trap, as well as investigate the temporal variation. And that's it. Thank you. Thanks, that was really interesting. Um, um, next up, we have uh, Sarah Roberts with the National View of Temporal Atmospheric Mercury Deposition across Canada and using lake sediment cores. Okay, hello, can you see my slides okay? Yes, we can see them and we can hear you, perfect. Thanks. Okay. Uh, so hello, I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at Environment Climate Change Canada, um, working with Jane Kirk, and I'll be presenting today work with the co-authors which were listed here, using sediment cores as an approach to assess recent trends in atmospheric and anthropogenic mercury deposition across Canada. So. Okay, so, sorry, one minute. Um, right, sorry, here we go. So the approach for the study is to assess the trends in, model in modern mercury deposition um, using post-1990 trends. And the cores span 19 different geographical regions across Canada, which include remote, urban, and industrial sites. The lake sites which have been called are um, small hydrologically um, simple lakes and a total of 82 cores have been collected which have been led to 10 dated and analysed for total mercury. From these records uh, we then calculate the anthropogenic mercury fluxes uh, using a baseline which is established from um, a period of pr uh, before industrialization specific for each of the regions. And the sediment core profiles um, are normalized for in-basin sedimentation. So sed sediment focusing corrections are applied to the fluxes and the influence of catchment area on the mercury deposition is assessed. Um, and so the studies of synthesis approach and multiple uh, statistical approaches were applied to assess trends in atmospheric mercury deposition, including trend tests um, like Mankendo analysis and synchrony analysis to see if trends are synchronous or asynchronous across Canada, or if they're significantly increasing or decreasing over recent time periods. 
Um, the study also looks at the factors which are influencing mercury deposition, so including lake area, catchment area, elevation, water depth, um, and also precipitation on the deposition. And we compare the sediment mercury profiles to monitoring records from stations which are within 100 kilometers of the lake site and to measurements derived from Canada's mercury deposition model. Um, our uh, results um, also examine if a multiple dated lake sediment core approach can be used to track regional changes in mercury deposition and therefore the effectiveness of national and international emission reductions. So the, some of the statistical approaches which were applied, uh, principal components analysis was performed to explore the spatial patterns in fluxes and the environmental factors and redundancy analysis was applied to explore the driving factors of mercury deposition. The results showed that uh, longitude was significantly driving the rate of change in anthropogenic mercury flux and also the distance um, closest to the point source site uh, was driving the patterns in the recent change in anthropogenic mercury fluxes. Um, the Mankendall trend tests, uh, which were applied to the post-1990 mercury fluxes uh, and the monitoring data, um, showed that uh, there was differences across Canada in the trend. So the plot here on the uh, right is showing the Mankendall coefficient scores with the with a positive number indicating an increase in trend and negative number increasing in, in, indicating ne a negative trend. And um, the results here are showing a decrease in trend in the five-year average of fluxes in the western regions of Canada and at lakes which are nearby major mercury point source sites and increase in trends in the far eastern regions. And we hypothesized that this west to east pattern which we see in the anthropogenic mercury fluxes could be due to rainfall patterns um, and with higher levels of uh, precipitation resulting in increased wet deposition and the soil erosion and, and soil and inwash of mercury from legacy stores in the catchment soils. So then moving on to the comparisons with the model data. So here are three different modeled um, scenarios of mercury fluxes obtained from the 19 regions. Um, so they include to model total mercury deposition, so wet and dry deposition, uh, wet deposition to the entire lake catchment, and total mercury deposition to the lake surface. Um, and so these scenarios, model scenarios, were run for 2015 using the Graham model, and then compared to the post-2005 sedimentary anthropogenic fluxes. Um, we found that with removing the point source site, there was a significant positive correlation between uh, the remote site sedimentary fluxes and the three modeled mercury deposition scenarios, with the strongest correlation seen for the model total deposition. Um, and so we hypothesized that the discrepancy seen um, when we look at this trend with including the point source site is due to the grid, grid size resolution and the fact that um, uh, the model doesn't take into account legacy inputs of mercury in the annual mercury deposition. Um, so overall, this study um, highlights um, how lake sediment cores can provide a useful natural archive, um, which is important for reconstructing past atmospheric and anthropogenic mercury, um, and useful for uh, tracking trends and assessing the response of mercury reducing efforts under the Minamata Convention and response to climate driven processes. That's the end of the presentation. Um, thank you very much. Thanks, Sarah. Very interesting way to, to look at the historical record. Um, we have one more um, poster presentation in the session, then we'll switch to uh, a quick panel. Um, this is Deborah Sauter with Lower Eastern Shore Ambient Air Quality Monitoring Project. There you go. Now are we good? We're good. Thank you. Thank you. I apologize. Um, my name is Deborah Sauter. I'm a member of the faculty at the University of Maryland Eastern Shore, which is on the eastern shore of Maryland between the Atlantic Ocean and the Chesapeake Bay. And uh, I'm taking part with a along with a teaching postdoctoral assistant, Bernice Bediaco, in the Lower Eastern Shore 
uh, ambient air quality monitoring project, which is being substantially managed by the Maryland Department of the Environment in response to citizen concerns about air quality near uh, large chicken feeding operations, which uh, are widely distributed across the eastern shore of Maryland. Um, the Lower Eastern Shore Air Monitoring Project is a one-year project which is collecting ambient air quality data uh, using standard techniques. Um, we started our collection at two different sites on the Eastern Shore, one uh, early in the spring and one a little bit later this spring, uh, following some consternation in dealing with the COVID. Whoops. Hmm. Up, up, up. Here we go. Um, our methods are very traditional methods. We have uh, sampling sites uh, on the eastern shore in two locations within about 20 miles of our campus. So uh, Dr. Betty Ako and I are managing these local uh, sampling sites uh, on behalf of our colleagues from Annapolis and uh, across the state. Um, we measure meteorological uh, parameters. We measure particulate matter 2.5 and 10. Um, and we measure NH3 and nitrogen uh, dioxide on a continuing basis. And all of this data is uh, available in almost real time uh, through the sampling, uh, through the deposition website. Um, we're also doing uh, to, to compare some Amon passive sampling. Uh, where we run passive samplers over two week windows um, at both of our sampling sites on the Eastern shore. Um, this is a, a site map of uh, four sites that are being used for contemporaneous measurements in the state of Maryland. Um, the Old Town site in uh, the Northern part of, of this region is in downtown Baltimore City and gives us data for a city location, which is certainly being affected by the current uh, COVID uh, shutdowns. The second site is at Horn Point, which is a, a Maryland Department of the Environment Research Center. It's in an area which is largely rural and agricultural, but much smaller uh, chicken feeding operations there than are present in uh, further down the shore here. Um, Stort's Neck is a farm uh, that's actually managed by the University of Maryland Eastern Shore. It's in a region that is uh, highly agricultural, but fairly low uh, concentration of chicken feeding um, in that area. And Pocomoke City is in the center of a substantial concentration of chicken farms. Um, and so here we have a, a sample of the density of chicken feeding operations within um, a two mile radius and, and a one mile radius of our site. The Pocomoke City site is immediately off the main northwest, north south thoroughfare on the Eastern Shore Route 13, um, you're within, you know, a, just a couple hundred yards of, of the highway on that sampling site. Uh, but within the two mile radius, there are 29 broiler houses, I'm sorry, 29 broiler houses within a one mile radius and 70 within a two mile radius. Our site is in the middle of a fairly open field, uh, but there is a working farm immediately to the north and an uh, and a, not industrial isn't quite the word, but a commercial site uh, that where we're occupied, where where our where our uh, sampling center is is located. In Stort's Neck, we have a more um, farm based uh, community, fewer poultry operations, um, and about fourteen miles away from the Pocomoke City site. Uh, the only uh, houses, chicken houses are outside of the one mile radius and at a two mile radius, uh, within a two mile radius of the, the Stort's Neck site. And we're in the process of getting this data now. Um, we have summary uh, data from April to September for, um, for all four of these sites for ammonia, the PM 2.5 and PM 10. Um, we can clearly see the influence of, um, of the chicken uh, feeding operation on the hourly average value of ammonia. Uh, we can see that uh, the PM 2.5s are pretty consistent across all the sites. And we can see um, that, that the rural 
uh, Prince of Sand and Pocomoke City PM10s are higher uh, than Horn Point, which is, I think, more uh, more rural, less de population density, probably less traffic, and a little bit more access to the water um, than any than either of the other sites on the eastern shore. And of course, the city site is uh, quite a different scenario with different uh, inputs and outputs managing um, that that those those data that we're accumulating at this point we're um we're just still in data collection model or mode and and we haven't started real serious analysis of our data yet but uh we do provide uh the live feed of all this data to the community and you can look at it if you're so inclined. Um, we'd like to thank our funding agencies for undertaking this project, both the Maryland Department of the Environment, the Delmarva Poultry Industry, and the Keith Campbell Foundation for the Environment have uh, helped to underwrite this project. And that's the end, thank you. Thanks, Deborah. Um, interesting. Um, Collaboration. It, yeah, it's been a it's been a fun collaboration with a variety of folks participating. <laughs> All right, so let me get this. Great. So I think there were some questions in the chat. Um, let me just. I guess we have until Greg. What do you want me to do? Um, this is the end of the. I guess the panel. Um, I didn't keep everyone on track the same way you did. Apparently, I'm not <laughs> as scary. Um, just kidding. <laughs> it's your subsession. You're, okay. You're driving the bus. <laughs> um, well, I think a lot of the questions in in the chat may have already been answered. Um, so I might just ask that people go to um, go to the other link um, and and chat there if there are additional follow-up questions for the speakers. Um, I think I can post it again there. Um, and we can move on to, to session three. That was really great um, and a wide range of, of topics. So hopefully everyone will, will utilize the, the breakout room to have further discussion with the, with the speakers. So a virtual round of applause for, for everyone. Thanks. Thanks, Greg. <laughs> okay. Session three is on um, atmospheric deposition modeling. Um, and our first speaker is um, Alexandria Wint um, with Atmospheric Inorganic Nitrogen Deposition to Latin American Cities, uh, comparison of field and geoschem model estimates. Thank you all for coming. Um, good afternoon. Let's take a quick break from COVID and journey to Latin America. Latin America is one of the most urbanized regions in the world. Approximately 80% of the population currently lives in urban areas, and depending on the country, 6 to 34% lives in megacities. And an increasing share of people are moving to small and medium-sized cities. Now, more people means more cars, and in 2015, there were approximately 201 vehicles per 1,000 inhabitants and motorization rates in the region are increasing over time. Now more cars means more nitrogen emissions to the atmosphere. So in Latin America, mobile sources are the primary source of NOx emissions to the atmosphere. And in general, most Latin American countries monitor urban air quality, especially in large cities. However, there are few corresponding measurements of atmospheric nitrogen deposition, despite potential effects on ecosystems and watersheds. Global atmospheric chemistry transport models can fill these gaps. So within this context, this research has two main objectives. First, to estimate rates of atmospheric wet inorganic nitrogen deposition to Latin American sites. And two, to evaluate the performance of geoschem in predicting nitrogen deposition rates within and across cities. To do this, we compiled data on measured rates of wet or bulk inorganic nitrogen deposition to 14 urban areas in Latin America from peer reviewed publications and atmospheric deposition monitoring networks. Estimates of nitrogen deposition were compiled for the period 2006 to 2010. 
wet and dry inorganic particulate nitrogen deposition were then modeled for each city and for each year using GS Chem. We evaluated the performance of GS Chem for modeling inorganic nitrogen deposition to the sites using spatial assessments, linear regression, and the normalized mean bias. Here we can see GS Chem model output for mean annual wet ammonium on the left, nitrate in the middle, and wet inorganic nitrogen deposition on the right. The dots, if you squint, you can see them, show mean annual observed nitrogen deposition at 14 sites. From the data compilation, we found that observed wet inorganic nitrogen ranges from about three to 17 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year. Ammonium comprised anywhere from 48 to 90% of inorganic nitrogen. Now, if we look at the model data, higher levels of nitrogen deposition map on very well to urban areas, which you can see here down in the right. In addition, we found that observed and model wet nitrogen deposition exhibited, exhibited similar spatial patterns. So urban areas with high observed nitrogen deposition, such as Mexico City, and here you can see Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo, generally fall within grid cells with high modeled nitrogen deposition. Here we can see the results from the linear regressions of model predicted and observed estimates of wet ammonium and nitrate deposition. The dashed line in the center represents the one-to-one -one line. So points that fall on the line indicate that the model is accurately predicting observed data. Points that fall below the line indicate model under prediction and points that fall above the line indicate model over prediction. The normalized mean bias or NMB is the statistic that averages the difference between model and observed values over the sum of observed values. So moving from left to right along the top in panel A, we can see that GS Chem values of wet ammonium deposition underestimate observed wet ammonium deposition at most of the sites. Now, if we look at panel B, just wanna call your attention to the fact that bulk deposition was generally measured at, at most of the sites, so 11 of the 14 sites. And thus it is possible that these collector, collectors captured some dry particulate ammonium. So we included dry particulate ammonium deposition into the model. And when we did this, we found that the strength of the relationship remained the same, but the bias was reduced from negative 45 to negative 41. Here at the bottom, if we look at panel D, we can see that GS Chem values of wet nitrate deposition both over and underestimate observed wet nitrate deposition. Including dry particulate nitrate in the model had no effect on the strength of the relationship or the bias. Overall, comparing the top two panels and the bottom two panels, we can see that GS Chem performed less well for nitrate than for ammonium. To conclude, our preliminary findings from this research suggest that even at core spatial resolution, GS Chem performs relatively well when compared to in-situ measured deposition in undersampled urban areas of Latin America. And with that, I just want to thank the organizers and all the staff at the NADP for a wonderful conference and for a wonderful network. Thank you. Thanks, Alexandra. Very interesting. Um, Next up, we have Kristen Foley um, with Equates, EPA's Air Quality Time Series Project. Hey, Kristen. Hey, Melissa. Get my screen going. All right. Well, uh, hi, everyone. I'm Kristen Foley. I'm a statistician um, in the EPA's Office of Research and Development, and I'm a member of the team that develops the Community Multi-Scale Air Quality Model, or CMAC. So I really appreciate the chance to talk a little bit today. Uh, kind of a status update of the EPA's Air Quality Time Series project that we're calling Equates. Uh, and this project represents a collaboration with really a, a large team of meteorological emissions and air quality modelers of EPA. So just want to acknowledge and, and thank my co-authors. So the goal of this project is uh, 16 years of CMAX simulations over the Northern Hemisphere and the continental US. Uh, and before describing our new modeling effort, I just wanted to provide some background on why we're doing this. So EPA has generated um, decade-long CMAX simulations previously that have been widely used. And so for example, this community might be familiar with um, 11 years of CMAX version 5.0.2, 10 
annual deposition estimates um, that are currently being used as input to TDEP maps and grids, are part of CastNet's annual deposition data, and a layer on EPA's EnviroAtlas and Critical Loads Mapper, um, and have been used to support various nutrients assessments. <clears throat> so uh, these tools and, and data products for years later than 2012 are still using the 2012 CMAC output, uh, and so don't capture trends over the later part of the most recent decade. Um, in addition, EPA's Office of uh, Air Quality Planning and Standards produces and then publicly hosts um, model observation fused surfaces for ozone and PM 2.5 from 2002 uh, through 2017. Uh, and this combines CMAC output and measurement data. However, uh, these surfaces um, have and these services have been used uh, for lots of epidemiological studies and, and other applications. Um, but different years of the few surfaces use CMAC different use different CMAC versions, ranging ranging from 4.6 all the way to 5.3. And this leads to discrepant discontinuities and bias that can impact the statistical models used in the epidemiological studies. So our new uh, time series will uh, include more recent years, uh, will be through 2017. It's gonna use CMAC version 5.3.2, which was just released this month. And it includes many advancements since 502, which was released back in 2014. Uh, it will use new uh, consistent set of meteorological inputs using uh, the MET model WARF version 4.1.1. Uh, and a very significant part of this project has been the development of new emissions inputs for these 16 years. Uh, using as consistent methods uh, as possible. We're also going to be including uh, hemispheric CMAX simulations to be used as the boundary conditions for our U.S. domain. And this is an update from past work because the boundary conditions uh, used for the 502 runs were derived from GeoSchem with uh, GeoS5 meteorology inputs. So now that we're switching to hemispheric CMAX and WARF, this creates consistency and modeling of the meteorology and the chemistry for the global transport and the regional scale processes, uh, which is important because changes in boundary conditions have been shown to have a significant impact on concentrations well into um, our continental US domain through different inflow particles and, and changes in chemistry. So here's just a quick uh, snapshot of improvements over the existing model of simulations. Uh, so WARF version 4.1.1 has more, a more realistic representation of vegetation coverage and LAI. And so this will directly impact uh, our CMAC estimates of dry deposition. We've also saw um, a precipitation bias at high elevation sites uh, that was present in our previous WARF modeling in 3.4 uh, has been really significantly reduced in 411 due to a new hybrid sigma pressure vertical coordinate system. In terms of our emissions, uh, many of our um, important emission sectors uh, were, have created completely new inventories, and that includes mobile, uh, fires, and organic emissions from volatile chemical products. And um, for other years, we're using the most recent NEI, 2017, and then um, creating uh, scaling factors to backcast that data in time using different surrogate information. In terms of uh, CMAC, CMAC version 5.3.2, um, includes improved treatment of organic aerosols, which leads to improved seasonal and diurnal patterns for PM 2.5. Uh, there were improvements in vertical mixing in version 5.1 uh, that are going to have a, a significant impact on bias in morning and evening transition hours. And then improvements in our deposition algorithms, including a land use specific de deposition estimates uh, through the stage module developed by Jesse Bash uh, and improved ozone deposition. So just in terms of uh, where we are and where we're going, the meteorology is complete, our um, emissions for Northern Hemisphere are complete, and we're very close to finishing uh, all of the emissions for uh, the continental US. And then our CMAX simulations will begin this fall, and once they're done, the deposition estimates uh, will be used for multiple EPA uh, tools and products such as TDEP and EnviroAtlas. And then we are planning to publicly share a subset of the model inputs and outputs uh, in 2021 uh, with the hope that uh, researchers can use this rich data, rich data set for uh, many different applications. So kind of stay tuned for the next stage of this project. So thank you for your time. Thanks, Kristen. Um, I don't know if I'd heard that it, a new um, acronym equates, but I like it. It's new. <laughs> Okay, um, next up we have um, Sharman Actor um, with another pre recorded 
poster, which Bob is teeing up now. We might have time for, for one more question for the speakers, a question for Kristen or Alexandria. I had a question for Alexandria. Um, what are the urban sources of, of reduced nitrogen in the urban areas of, of Latin America? So I'm assuming that cars would be one, mobile sources as well, but also Latin America is different in the sense that there is waste burning that happens in the cities, also landfills and you know agriculture around the edges and also within the cities. So they're much more, I think we forget about those, those urban sources. Um, so biomass burning, agriculture, um, and also cars. Great, thanks. Okay, um, thanks to, to our speakers for session two and three, and it's time for Greg to take over again for session four. So we have uh, session subsession four now, atmospheric deposition and extreme conditions. 2020 has been a year of record wildfires, uh, an incredible hurricane season and uh, record drought. And so, we want to be uh, completely consistent and timely with that. And lo and behold, we have three presentations, uh, three posters that are on those topics. And so let's go forward to Jennifer Ho Holguin. Um, okay, sounds good. Okay. All right. So hi, everyone. My name is Jennifer Holguin, and I am a PhD student at the University of Texas at El Paso. And my poster is on a lab incubation experiment, which has implications on studying nitrogen deposition in drylands. So as we all know, anthropogenic nitrogen deposition can result in a variety of environmental issues. However, we have notably incomplete understanding of how nitrogen deposition can affect dryland ecosystems, which are essentially one of the largest terrestrial systems on Earth. And predictions based off limited dryland nitrogen deposition studies are uncertain due to inconsistencies among responses. For example, in some nitrogen dryland addition studies, we see or they report really strong responses to added nitrogen, where others report either very little or no response to nitrogen. So to better understand the effects of nitrogen deposition in drylands, we established a field experiment in the Chihuahuan Desert grasslands of Carlsbad Caverns National Park. And we are studying the effects of nitrogen on plants and biogeochemistry. So it's important to also uh, mention that Carlsbad Caverns National Park and the region is currently, or is, is experiencing increased levels of nitrogen deposition due to oil and gas activity immediately adjacent to the park. So before we, uh, we established the field experiment, we wanted to determine if there were any resource or resource combinations which limit biota activity, biotic activity. And in particular, we wanted to look at the um, biotic activity that might be limited by these resources in soil microbes. And soil microbes are extremely important. They are the backbone to ecosystem functioning. So we established a fully factorial carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus addition experiment where we incubated soils collected from one of my sites in Carlsbad at field capacity to ensure that the microbes were not limited by water as they often are in drylands. And the variables that we measured include microbial activity, so respiration, extractable carbon and nitrogen pools, and soil microbial growth, so microbial biomass carbon, nitrogen and phosphorus. And then uh, these variables were measured at 24 hours and again at 16 days. And here are my results for soil microbial biomass. So I'm gonna concentrate on day 16 for the sake of time. And it's more interesting than day one. <laughs> so what we see is that microbial growth, so microbial biomass carbon was limited by both nitrogen and phosphorus alone and in combination. And then for microbial biomass nitrogen, which indicates nitrogen uptake by the microbial community, we see that there's various combinations which increase nitrogen uptake. However, what's important here is that 
the sucrose or carbon addition and phosphorus together increase nitrogen uptake um, without even adding any nitrogen. And then for microbial biomass phosphorus, which is phosphorus uptake by microbes, we see that the phosphorus uptake is limited, uh, co-limited by both nitrogen and phosphorus. And then here are my results for soil microbial respiration, which is essentially just a snapshot of microbial activity at the time of measurement. And what we see here is from day one to day 16 is that there's an overall decrease in activity. And this could be due to a variety of reasons. Um, for example, when you first give uh, water to soil, it can result in a burst of activity. So maybe that day one, there was that burst and then the microbes kind of acclimated to the water that we were giving them um, constantly. Um, or also we could have a change in a shift in microbial community. There's just many reasons that could um, come along with that. So moving on, we see hints of nitrogen and phosphorus limitations to microbial activity, but it, of course it's only hints of it. And then we also see that when we add sucrose, so the labile carbon source, we see increases in soil microbial activity. However, this is not reflected in microbial biomass carbon. So this just suggests that the microbes are being inefficient with the carbon that we're adding. They're not really um, using that carbon to build more biomass. So in conclusion, it's important for nitrogen addition studies to consider other underlying resources which may limit biotic response to nitrogen additions. And particularly in drylands um, with water, we could capture points where water is limiting and we don't see any response to nitrogen and we can thus provide a, a false negative in that aspect. And that's it. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. Um, so let's see. We're going to go to uh, hurricanes now with uh, Yishi. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Yishi and I'm a PhD student. Uh, I work with doc Dr. Felix at Texas A&M University, Corpus Christi. So my work is uh, study hurricane charcoal stone rainwater chemistry in the US from 2008 to 2019. So for hurricane and charcoal stone events, they have been increasing for the past two decades and they are expected to keep increasing for the rest of this century. So this extreme event has hit us badly. Thus a systematic analysis of that is necessary to prepare us and to be an implication for future policymaking. So I uh, obtained my data from the website of NADP. I first downloaded the CVS file contains all the longitude and the latitude of the, of the entire ring collection site and I upload this data into the GIS map so I can get a map that shows the location of the, each ring collection site. Then I went to uh, NOAA's website and I downloaded the best chart of each hurricane and truck stone event. And I upload this chart file into the GIS map so I can get a map that shows which hurricane event uh, affect uh, which uh, ring collection site. Then I went to the uh, NADP website again, and I downloaded the history data of this uh, affected ring collection site. So it's an Excel sheet looking like this, and I extracted the data I need just based on the time period of that uh, hurricane event. So that's how I collected my data, and in total I have collected 164 hurricane and tropical storm data, and I compared them with the rest 5,602 normal rain data just in the affected area. And uh, here is my results. So for the table on the left, it shows the contribution of hurricane and tropical storm events to the annual rainfall and iron stabilizations. So it shows that just one single hurricane event can contribute a mean of 8% annual rainfall 
and quite an amount of iron stabilizations. So it should be noted that those numbers in this column can be easily underestimated because um, some areas are less affected by the hurricane winds, um, which can ignore the general contribution. But those numbers is also very good to give you guys a general idea of what those hurricane winds can contribute. And it also shows that uh, just one single hurricane can uh, contribute uh, in some area, can contribute over half of the iron deflations, uh, which can be easily over the potential critical load. And for the figures on the right as the coronation factors among species in both normal rain events and in hurricane events. So we can say that uh, the ions like magnesium, sodium, and chloride, they all have very high coordination factors, suggesting they are from the same source, which is also in accordance with the results of positive matrix factorization. So for those pie charts, the purple color shows the source of marine. It shows that marine contributes most of the magnesium, chloride, and sodium. And it also shows that during hurricane events, uh, the source of marine contributes more uh, sea salt calcium and sea salt sulfate. And during hurricane events, the contribution from fossil fuel from agriculture is also getting evident. So here is my conclusion that hurricane and tropical storm events have been increasing and they are expected to keep increasing. So those events can contribute a substantial portion of annual rain and iron populations within just a few hours. Uh, this, those events can entrain more marine materials and uh, deposit more sea salt ions. So that's all for my work. Thanks for listening. Now I'm ready for questions. Great. Wow. Um, yeah, I guess hurricanes are pretty important to critical loads. I don't know how much that is um, discussed on, uh, among the critical loads folks, but uh, this year it's particularly important, I would think. Um, okay. Thank you. And uh, I guess we have uh, Thomas uh, with us now. And so... Yes. So sorry about the time. No, no problem. That, hey, you made it to the session. <laughs> You're good, man. Okay, thank you. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Thomas Williamson, and today I'm going to talk, be talking to you about my master's thesis research titled The Characterization of Texas Wildfires During a 2011 to 2014 Drought, uh, a prelude to identifying chemical signatures of smoke and rain. The image you see in the background was taken on April 19th, 2011 at a wildfire which occurred just outside of Straw in Texas. Um, and as I'll discuss shortly, 2011 was the most severe year for wildfires in Texas. Uh, during what would become the most severe drought in Texas recorded history, um, and it spanned from 2011 to 2014. So before I get into results, uh, I want to briefly explain how I'm tackling my research. Essentially, there are three major objectives to completing my analysis, and today I'm going to be focusing on the left and center columns. Um, to begin, I have two goals to accomplish. The first is to characterize the frequency, magnitude, and spatio -tem temporal distribution of wildfires, um, and the second is to examine wildfire effects on smoke incidents, rainwater chemistry, and atmospheric deposition during this exceptional drought. Uh, to address those goals, I first characterized wildfires and events by building an overall time series of events from 2011 to 2014, utilizing the Monitoring Trends and Burn Severity Database, or NTBS. Um, from there, I analyzed the frequency, magnitude, and distribution of the wildfires, including those considered extreme. Uh, and the second step was to identify smoke incidents at each of the NTN network sites during the most severe drought year. And I did that by analyzing daily smoke polygons, courtesy of the Hazard Mapping Systems Database of Smoke Polygons. And from there, I was able to calculate the frequency, density, and source of smoke for each location in the NCN network. So as I briefly mentioned, uh, we utilized the wildfire data from the MTBS to investigate wildfire patterns. Uh, the figure on the right displays all wildfires which occurred during the drought within Texas. Size of the dots represents the percentile for each wildfire based on hectares burned, uh, ranging from less than 80th as the smallest dot to 95th percentile as the largest. And the colors represent the year the wildfire occurred, with red representing 2011, orange being 2012, yellow 2013, and green 2014. Um, during the entire period, uh, 324 wildfires burning greater than or equal to 405 hectares, which is the minimum hectares for NTBS cataloging to occur, uh, were recorded. 
Immediately, we noticed that the vast majority of these wildfires were concentrated in Western Texas and were predominantly temporally constrained within 2011. Uh, in fact, 72% of all the wildfires occurred in 2011, including the 17 fires, which make up the 95th percentile. Um, and after that, we categorized the most extreme wildfires at, at, as those which occurred in the 95th percentile of Hectarsburg. Um, each of the 17 wildfires occurred in 2011, 14 of which occurred in West Texas. The top figure displays a map of the location of each of the 17 wildfires um, with the numbers representing the overall rank of the fire in terms of hectares burned. And these fires represented just 5% of overall wildfires, but also represented 95, 90% of all the hectares that were burned during the drought from 2011 to 2014. Um, we then analyzed the land covers that were consumed by these extreme wildfires. The bar chart at the bottom of the slide gives a breakdown of each individual wildfire's land cover burn with the same ranking system as shown in the map above. Uh, we found that each of the West Texas wildfire predominantly burned shrub scrub land cover, accounting for anywhere from 53 to 99% of the land burned per fire. Uh, and those fires are located within the Chihuahua Desert, High Plains, Edwards Plateau, Southwestern Tablelands, and Central Great Plains ecoregions. Um, and the remaining three wildfires predominantly burned evergreen forest land cover and were within the Cross Timbers, East Central Texas Plains, and South Central Texas Plains. Finally, smoke incidents was determined at all eight Texas NTN sites in 2011, which are shown in the top right uh, figure, the most severe drought year. Um, the HMS data showed that the sites with the highest number of recorded smoke days in 2011 included Texas 3, Beeville with an N of 81, Texas 16, Sonora with an N of 77, Texas 10, Atwater with an N of 76, and Texas 56, LBJ National Grasslands with an N of 73. Uh, these sites were also more heavily impacted by heavy smoke days compared to the other sites. Um, Texas 56 experienced the most such days with an N of six, uh, followed by Texas three with an N of five. Um, primary origins of smoke at Beeville were Texas accounting for 31%, Mexico accounting for 26%, and Central America accounting for 26% as well. And the LBJ site uh, in North Texas was heavily impacted by the same sources accounting for 63%, um, but was also affected by neighboring states, New Mexico, Oklahoma, and Arkansas accounting for 16%. And based on that information, three focal sites were selected to examine the influence of wildfire on rainwater chemistry and uh, composition and deposition. And to this end, we first uh, determined potential smoke and rain events as weeks when a site was affected by smoke and rainfall using the HMS and NTN precipitation information. And after this, uh, our next steps include calculating back trajectory of rainfall events and air masses utilizing high split, and then conducting chemical composition analysis on smoke and rain sample weeks to determine if chemical signatures of smoke are present. And then of course, severe droughts in future decades will lead to increased wildfire events across the Southwestern United States, uh, making it imperative to understand the effects of wildfire on the chemical composition of rainwater and potential impacts of deposition loading to ecosystems. And thank you for your time. Thank you, Thomas. Um, yeah, very important work, especially right now. Um, so uh, I think there's probably immediate application to what you're doing. Um, so hurry up. No, uh, very, very good work. And uh, <laughs> thank you for sharing your presentation. Um, so uh, that is all of the poster sessions, uh, the poster presentations, but uh, don't go away. Uh, if people have questions you'd like to address to um, our presenters, uh, we, we, we'd like to have facilitate that discussion. Um, we see several uh, um, comments that I think have been answered in the chat function so far. Um, so let me see if there's anything that has not been answered in the chat function. Um, one, one thing that was interesting, uh, uh, Yiji uh, had a, a question, uh, what about pH, any difference between hurricane and normal? And uh, she responds, in fact, the pH of, hur of uh, hurricanes is 5.37, slightly higher than normal rain, 5.14, but they're both lower than 5.6, which is the pH of unpolluted rainwater in equilibrium with atmospheric CO2. So um, uh, that, that's interesting. Um, I. I, I want, wondered um, how um, uh, the, the hurricane information will, will affect uh, critical loads um, uh, assessment. And, and, and I, I, I had the same question about the drought. So, you know, two extreme conditions. You have um, basically as much as 
50 to 80 percent of uh, the annual load of, of uh, certain constituents being delivered in a hurricane um, in, in, on the one end. And then you, at, for, for drought conditions, you've got all this dry deposition occurring and not being assimilated by the organisms um, until you just add water. And so um, I, I I, I think that those are like two end members that um, to me seem very important in, in looking at critical loads. And, and so um, I, I, I don't know if anyone has a comment on that, especially uh, Jennifer, you know, um, seems to me that maybe you could comment on for, for drought conditions. Um, are, are, are the, uh, are the organisms that, that you're looking at, um, uh, important in fixing nitrogen so that there, it's available for uh, sensitive species that might be looked at for critical loads? Um, so there are definitely some, well, I, I guess my expertise would mostly be in drylands. And in particular, uh, in the region that I'm studying, there is a ton of bile crusts which live symbiotically with cyanobacteria and they're import really important nitrogen fixers. So yeah, I would say during drought conditions, we're not probably not seeing as much nitrogen um, being fixed. So that would potentially be a big loss to, of nitrogen to the system. And for plants, of course, and everything that relies on this extra nitrogen. Well, well, I hope that uh, you can uh, incorporate your work in, in, into uh, what the critical loads um, group is doing in NADP, and, and, and I invite you to do so. Absolutely. So my project is actually under um, one of the critical loads, uh, how would you say it, mission. So under Dr. Mike Bell, oh. he's the one that set this entire thing up because we just really don't know what... Um, the critical loads are in drones as much as we do in more music systems. So yeah, uh, this past year, we just saw a really extreme drought and we even added water to our, to one of our field sites and it doesn't look like that helped either. But yeah, I think we'll, we'll definitely see some interesting responses um, this year versus the other years where we did get pretty good amount of rain in comparison at least. So stay Great. tuned. <laughs> I'll Great. come up with more later. <laughs> Greg? Great. So, um, you know, with regard to the drought um, impacts, you know, in California, we have a drought every summer and we get this accumulation of dry deposition on the surfaces. Then we get the first rains that flush it into the soil. And um, that's the point also when the soil becomes alive again, or a lot more alive. So it's when we see our highest uh, nitrate and ammonium levels in the soil is right there in the fall after we get the first rains. Um, and and it, it means the systems are kind of leaky. There's something Mark, Fenn, and other folks have pointed out because of the asynchrony between the precipitation and uh, temperature, and, um, you know, we just have this period when you can get a pulse of nitrogen leaching out, and it, some of it seems to be sort of a natural background. So we have to be careful about, you know, small levels of nitrate and ground groundwater and surface water um, being a critical load indicator because we have a natural background leak. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Well, uh, I, I'm sure that we'll we'll learn more from from Jennifer as she completes her work and uh, and uh, becomes more involved with uh, with the critical loads group of NADP. Thank you. And then, um, yeah. So I, I, on the other end of the spectrum, um, you know, for for hurricanes, I, I was I was glad that uh, uh, you she had some data that our equipment wasn't just destroyed and swept away and that we actually collected some data so that she could do the analysis. Um, I mean, that's, that's often our, our biggest concern in a hurricane is will the equipment survive? Um, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that our network was able to provide that, uh, 
that those data for, for, for your analysis. So um, again, on the critical loads side of things for hurricanes, um, you know, your, your work is showing that a tremendous amount of, of load can be delivered just in one storm. And so um, I wonder how, uh, I wonder how that uh, affects our, um, the use of our critical loads exceedance maps, you know, that, that are, that are being made right now, because in, in, you know, it, it, you can, you can try to um, implement management controls and yet one big storm just kind of, uh, kind of wrecks it for you. And I guess, I guess I, I'd like to invite the, uh, the critical loads folks to chime in on, on, on Yishi's work too. Hey, this is Mike. Um, yeah, I think that's something I've been interested that like going back to the dry lens as well as like this hurricane um, loading, which I hadn't really thought about in the past, but thinking about kind of like temporal responses of like when nitrogen is added to the system or made biologically available versus when the growing season or when these plants are actually responding. I feel like with the uh, hurricane work, there's a lot of questions around what happens to that nitrogen like if it's flooding if it's overland flow and like like washes into uh, uh, waterways or if it is actually taken up by ecosystems and uh, yeah I know we've had some questions I think I'm, I'm curious with Jennifer's work and one of the things we're we're hoping to figure out is looking at like monsoonal patterns in dry lands and seeing if that versus Californian drylands, like washes out the, or like changes the dynamics of nitrogen in the system. So there is like this summer bloom versus a uh, uh, winter um, loading of nitrogen. It's, uh, I don't really know how to solve that problem because I mean, especially when we're looking at annual maps, but digging into it a little deeper for some of these areas will probably be really important. So, so I don't policy. know a lot of, oh, sorry, Emmy. I don't know oh. if you wanted me to even answer, Mike. <laughs> but, I mean, I uh, on that. So we're not, I don't really know much about California, but uh, I guess one way that, we, that we're trying to figure out the temporal aspect of, of how nitrogen behaves in at least our system, where we made sure to include sampling and in all uh, during, like different season. So we're taking during pre-monsoon, monsoon, and then the winter time. And I guess we'll we'll see the patterns whenever I I synthesize everything up. That's it. About the hurricanes, um, it could also be um, changes in in behavior right before the hurricanes. Uh, in North Carolina, if there's a hurricane that's going to sweep right up. Uh, the farmers are, the restrictions on what farmers do with um, pig lagoon contents are relaxed. And so they'll generally spray um, the pig lagoons onto the field so that it's on purpose um, put into the air and into the soil before the hurricane gets there, just so that the flooding isn't directly spreading ammonia all over the place. Um. Wow. Theory that could like increase deposition farther away, but if you're aerosoling in, it can move it with it. It's an interesting addition or a mission addition. Yeah. Yeah, I've been, I, I've taken to heart that the, one of the best things that you can do for the planet is change your diet. And even though I love pork. Okay, so <laughs> um, well, thank, thank you. And then Thomas, uh, for, for wildfire, we're, the, the state of Colorado is burning up. State of California is burning up. Um, we've had, I think, 24 inches of snow on the, uh, on the biggest fire in our state's history. And I still don't think it's out. And so um, this, is, this is a huge deal right now. And, and we have a lot of samples 
Um, I think uh, Melissa was just telling me that, you know, they're, I can't remember, I think it was Melissa saying that, you know, hey, that this haze is showing up on the East Coast from West Coast fires. And, 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 uh, and so we have fire components, you know, uh, deposition components from these fires um, in our samples now. And we're doing a little bit of work and collaborating with some researchers to try to get some samples analyzed for some different things. What would, what would you say to the NADP right now, Thomas, would be important for, um, for us to try to do right now? What's the most important samples or kind of data that we could collect um, regarding wildfires? You know, um, I'm, I'm not too sure. I haven't gotten too much into the chemical analysis yet, but we're hoping that as we see these samples and the chemical compositions um, from these smoke and rain events, that we'll get some some good indicators um, of, of where these wildfires came from, um, which kind of goes back to the land covers that were burned. And maybe we'll see, you know, um, some more inorganic compounds in this, or maybe we'll see some sodium um, or calcium from the uh, wildfires that occurred in Central America, but then the smoke traveled all the way uh, up into North Texas. And kind of like you were saying, I mean, it's it was just astounding to me when I started looking at the data of how far this smoke was traveling um, and where it was coming from. Um, and, it, and it really varied by the years too, of course, or by the seasons, of course, um, due to just different uh, circulation patterns. But um, yeah, hopefully we'll get some pretty interesting um, chemical composition analysis as I kind of move more into that, um, hopefully in the next few weeks. Great, well, thanks. Um, well, I wanna thank all of our presenters in this poster session. This this worked uh, better than I ever expected. I thought I thought it went pretty well. And uh, I, I thought everyone did a terrific job of, of kind of staying on time and fantastic topics. A lot of really cool research being done out there. Um, I wanna thank all of our presenters. And I wanna thank everyone for hanging in to the bitter end of the 2020 NADP Scientific Symposium. Unfortunately, we're, um, we're kind of ending uh, somewhat unceremoniously. So this is it. This is the closing ceremonies of the entire symposium. And uh, we had really great participation. We had, uh, as we indicated earlier on, um, a lot of international participation. We intend to have this, uh, this technology, of course, be a part of our uh, future um, symposiums. And, uh, but we, we really would prefer to see everybody in person. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sure that everyone agrees that uh, the potential for collaboration is hugely increased by us meeting together. So hopefully um, next year we'll have a different situation and we'll be able to be together. But for those of you that cannot travel, uh, we're going to have uh, this uh, mode of, of conference participation be available certainly in the future. So. Um, but, but next year we're going to charge something. So anyways, so we got freebie this year, but, uh, ne next year we'll definitely go, go back to, uh, to having a fee for the conference, but, um, we really appreciate everyone's participation. Uh, and thank you once again. Um, if, if anyone else would like to chime in, uh, I, 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 I welcome that. Otherwise, uh, we'll, uh, we'll, We'll call that a symposium. And next week, again, on uh, Wednesday, uh, no, yes, Wednesday and Thursday next week, uh, the technical committees will meet. So if you want to know how the sausage is made in NADP, if you want to know the nuts and bolts and how everything works within, it, within NADP, you're certainly welcome to, to tune into that. And uh, since you are all um, members of NEDP for having attended a meeting, uh, you can actually vote in the meeting. So um, if you if you wanna to come to the meeting and uh, express your opinion, well, we welcome that. Um, definitely definitely want to, to hear the, the opinions of all the, the researchers who are using our data. Um, so I invite you to do that next week. All right. Thanks, Good. thanks, Greg. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good job, Greg. Okay. This was great. I mean, an ending with 63 people in the poster session is, is definitely a win. We had a high of, I think, 84. Nice. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great Friday attendance. See what happens when you don't serve alcohol? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, Greg, shame I was going to say that there's no shame in, 
and having a beer before noon Colorado time. So uh, there yeah. you go. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm at the bed center, so <laughs> I'm on the <laughs> clock. Go, go home. Right. Good job, Christy. Yeah, you are. <laughs> Thank you very much, Melissa. Bye, guys. Thanks no problem. Sorry, I'm running over. No, no, it's fine. <laughs>